Um, all right, so I, I, I want to first start off, uh, which is a little bit unusual by apologizing for those who are expecting Professor Bell. I hope you'll find me to be an adequate substitute. Um, one thing that I wanted to note about the book uh, is that it's free for you all to download. Uh, there's a QR code on the sign, I believe, uh, in the back of the room, uh, in the back of the room that you can uh, use to access the book. Also, if you search on the Yale Law School Library website and the Yale University website, for the book, it'll pop up with a link directly to, to the PDF so you can read it uh, in its entirety for free uh, without having to secure the physical copy. Um, I wanted to just kind of make one comment about the book before we dive into the questions with, with our authors, um, which is that this book is incredibly timely and it's incredibly topical, but it's also the culmination of many years of work. Um, and that's one thing that's really striking about it. It's kind of fortuitous. It's a happy circumstance that um, this book has been written at the time that it's been written um, because it's, it's never been more relevant to talk about the issues that are discussed in the book. Um, but again, the knowledge that's reflected in the book is a long time coming. It, it isn't just kind of the musings of what current events may, may lead us to. It really is the culmination of what we know about policing uh, and what we know about what it needs to be improved. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask questions to our panelists. Um, they're they're going to be open for both panelists to respond, but I'll direct them to one to start us off. Uh, Tom, we'll start off with you. Um, can you explain what legitimacy-based policing is? Well, when you think about policing in America, what we normally think of is a group who has a responsibility for maintaining social order, and they use tools to do so through basically using force to get compliance, which is why we see the police with all kinds of weapons and why we see them approaching people from the perspective of you have to obey me. Many police would recognize there are problems with this approach, many of which we see every day, like excessive use of force, resistance. But is there an alternative model? What we've done, as George said, over several decades is try to produce a research-based model that's a different model. And the first component of that model is to build up the legitimacy of the police in the minds of the people in the community so that people feel a responsibility and an obligation to follow the law, to obey police directives, and they do so more willingly without a focus on force. The key to this is that we have to have some way of telling the police how to act so that they are experienced as legitimate in their communities. And fortunately, based upon research, we have a really clear idea of what people want when they deal with the police and how they evaluate the legitimacy of the police. And that is they look at how those officers or that department exercises its authority in the community. This is a, a term for that is procedural justice, but what it basically means is people think they deserve justice among the people who are acting in their community using authority. This means they think they're entitled to voice, an opportunity to have input into decisions, to speak their mind, to state their case. They're entitled to be shown that the procedures being used by the police are unbiased or neutral, so they should be transparent, there should be explanations. They're entitled to treatment with courtesy and respect. And they're entitled to deal with officers who are trying to do what's best for the people in the community, what's good for the needs and concerns for the people around them and themselves, not some special interests that the police might have. All of those things together constitute criteria for whether the police are being fair or not. So if you take those two pieces together, you have legitimacy is important, and it's an alternative to force and coercion in gaining compliance. Legitimacy itself can be achieved and maintained through attention to fairness, as fairness is understood in the community. And I think finally I just say that we think a big important point about this is you can get compliance, and all of the research shows that people comply more willingly, but also just as frequently 
if they're approached in this way. But also, they're much more willing to cooperate. So many things that help us to fight crime in the community, like cooperation from people in terms of identifying criminals, testifying, are enhanced if people think the police are legitimate. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is, um, you know, this concept of procedural justice is sort of the term that you hear more often. I, Tom and I sort of made when Cambridge reached out and asked us if we'd be interested in writing this part of the series, they said, will you write a book on procedural justice? And we said, well, we'll write a book on legitimacy, right? And how that applies to policing. You know, legitimacy is the goal. Procedural justice should be seen as a framework to help you get there. And it can be applied in different, different situations different interactions among police, internal to police organizations. Um, and we'll talk a little through policy creation, all of that. So when we talk about procedural justice, we really are think we want you to understand there is a framework here. It has to do with respect, with voice, with listening, all of this. That is how we get to a police force being more legitimate. And um, in, in general, when we think about legitimacy, I think even a decade ago, people weren't really using this terminology every day when they thought about police or they thought about the criminal legal system. Certainly not just the police, but other criminal legal authorities are now, we're having conversations about legitimacy, like the legitimacy of the courts, all of that. So again, this is that we're talking about a goal of legitimacy-based policing, and we're going to tell you why specifically it works well for policing, but in general, this theory of it is important that people exercising authority be viewed as legitimate so that we have a, you know, bi-directional working relationship to reach our goals around public safety. Caroline, can you talk a little bit more about why this model is better? Sure. Um, I mean, not to be coy, but I think anything would be better at this point. Um, you know, the traditional model is expensive, it's carceral, it's overly punitive, it um, has, it is not working the way we want it to work. Like, really, there's sort of, um, we know that what we're doing right now is not, is not cutting cutting it. So I think the best way to think about why this model is better is to look at it in the short term and the long term. So on a day-to-day -day basis, how is legitimacy-based policing better? Okay, It allows the cops to do their jobs better. And when I say that, I mean it allows the cops to do the job that they are actually doing every day. Not show up in a helicopter in a SWAT to a, you know, a level 10 crisis, okay? What cops actually do most of the day is, uh, you know, perform tasks that have to do with social order, welfare checks, these sort of things. So. It is very important that the police approach the people in these situations from a procedural justice perspective so that they, in the short term, can work together to sort of handle these sort of interactions that, aren't, that don't need to escalate to use of force, right? Um, so as Tom was saying, you know, the traditional goal of policing is to stop crime. Cooperation is important because we need the community to work with police to be witnesses, for victims to come forward, for them to trust the police. We know that with legitimacy-based policing, we'll see something which is called a clearance rate. I'm not sure people are familiar with this term, but basically a clearance rate means that following a crime, there, you know, the, the case was cleared, an arrest was made. They can sort of say, all right, we've done our due diligence as a cop and we've cleared this crime from our cache or whatever so we in the short term we need this we need this relationship to work well so that police can do the job we want them to do and do it well on the long term and this is one of the things we're talking about this idea of community vitality is that police are a massive part of what's visible in our communities they are the most visible type of authority they are the visible law and order 
And when we know that when the community trusts the police and see them as legitimate, we see other things sort of going well in the community, higher social cohesion, um, better community development, more engagement by citizens in their community. So it's, it's um, you know, I often joke and say it's not rocket science, but it is science, right? And, and we know that to have a community that is healthy and, and working well, we sort of need all of our public institutions to be operating at the best level possible and with legitimacy so that we can sort of make sure our the citizens of that community are also uh, participating. So just to echo what Caroline said, the police say often that you can't arrest your way out of crime. And what they mean is that using a force-based approach with arrests as a primary tool you can suppress crime in the immediate moment, but you haven't really changed the conditions that are producing the crime. And so in a sense, you could say you just have to have the same police force around all the time, constantly suppressing crime. But even the police recognize that it would be better to be able to control crime while you're building the community. So if the community were more socially, economically developed, as Caroline said, there would be less crime. And so what we really want is a strategy that in the moment is equally effective at suppressing immediate crime, which legitimacy does, but which also has the potential over time of building communities. And again, as Caroline said, legitimacy creates the conditions under which communities can develop. So over time, the crime rate just becomes less of a problem because it's a stronger community. Tom, I mentioned earlier how, how this book really is kind of the culmination of, of decades, really, of work. Um, so then the question now becomes, why this book at this time? One of the things that's true if you're a social scientist who wants to change policy is you have to have a moment when the people in positions of power are actually interested in the possibility of change. And what we see in the area of criminal justice over and over again is that there is some crisis, like the George Floyd event was a crisis, and suddenly everyone recognizes that we need reform, there's momentum, and then the momentum goes away. But during the moment, when there is that momentum, what policymakers tend to do is they look for shovel-ready solutions. They look for, like, I want to take something off the shelf and it'll tell me what to do. We already saw that in our work 10 years ago when suddenly the police started talking about the need for legitimacy because they recognized that the community didn't trust them. So in the Obama task force, that came into a moment of saying community trust is a really important thing for policing. Well, our idea is to have the material ready for the unfortunately inevitable next time we have a crisis in policing to articulate the case for a new model, to lay out what that new model would look like, and then to be ready when policymakers are again recognizing that they need to rethink policing we can say, here's, here's a solution. Think about this. It's already here. Yeah, and I think we're going to pivot here in a minute and get into more of the questions around community vitality. But I think sort of a why now is that Tom and myself and other members of the collaboratory are like right now focused on this idea of community vitality and like is this a theory we can build up and what does it mean? So, you know, again, we could have written a book just on policing, but we were very intentional in saying here's a book about policing, but we'd like to sneak in this new idea that really it's less about the police and it's more about how do we create places that are safe. So when there's a crisis and you're frantically trying to fix the police, can you take a moment 
and be contemplative about the problem and then say, well, actually, if we invested in the community and here's a nice little primer on how to get started. So it was a way for us to try also try and get the people who would typically read this to read something that they probably re wouldn't read a book called The Promotion of Community Vitality, <laughs> but they might read something that's more of a handbook about how to be, you know, how to run a better police force, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just a, one comment on what Caroline said, and so something that maybe isn't obvious, but we wrote this book for a series that's read by police chiefs, criminologists, criminal justice people, so the target that Caroline is talking about is a reason we thought this book really would be good in this framework, because it will be read by those people. Yeah. Caroline, uh, you, you, you've previewed the concept yeah. of community vitality a, a couple of times already. Can you expand on that a little bit more and talk about its intersection with policing? Sure. So I have to say, when you're trying to connect these two dots, um, I already said my, my word of the semester is thoughtful. I'm just like always telling people to remember to be thoughtful in what you do. I think you do really have to stop and be thoughtful about what this means, okay? Because people say like, uh, you know, people maybe hear this concept and they say, listen, I do not envision a world at all where police are helping create a vital, healthy community. Like, no, I, I do not see the overlap. So I want to be really, I want to try and articulate what we mean when we say this. If the goal of the police is to stop crime, as Tom was just saying, to get to a place of the absence of crime, we say it is not enough to have the absence of harm. You have to have the presence of well-being to have safety. These two things have to go together, okay? So we have a traditional paradigm in our country. The cops are the things that make places safe. But we know the actual things that make places safe our shelter, education, health care, environmental design, all of these things, okay? So if we want to reduce the footprint of police, reduce the opportunity for police to escalate and kill people, then we have to create communities that are safer. And you do this through all of these other, through creating a vital community. The intersection is that cops are the ones who have the most interaction day to day on the street with the people in the community. So there needs to be, again, this sort of like bi-directional understanding that the cops are going to let the community, let the policymakers, the other stakeholders create well-being so that crime is not as big of a problem and the cops can go back to sort of the original way this was designed and it's a relationship that is not so, you know, hazard by implicit, explicit bias, um, toxic interactions, all of that. So that's, that's the connection. You know, I think one of the things that Caroline said that's true is most of us find it hard to think of the police as agents of community development. But I, I think the thing you have to realize is that's really not necessary that's a product of the current culture of policing. And what a lot of the evidence that we put together shows is that a different style of policing, a different approach by the police, where the police are more of a police service than a police force, does have the potential for giving people a framework of reassurance that helps to promote the social cohesion of communities, makes people more comfortable, doing things that develop the economy of different communities. And, you know, looking at it from a different point of view, as Caroline also said, the police exist. And they're not going away. In fact, the number of police officers in America is the same as it was in 1980, when the crime rate was four times as high it is, as it is now. So there's all these people out there trained in a skill that they less and less use who hopefully can be repurposed to engage in behavior that helps. And so what we do is highlight a lot of ways in which we think that can happen and the benefits to both the police and the community of trying to encourage that. And I think this kind of repurposing of the police may be a much more politically palatable kind of reform than discussions about eliminating the police because whatever else is true, substantial proportions of the population, both white and minority, get very nervous about the idea of reducing police. So instead of saying, let's get rid of the police, we say, let's get them to do something useful. 
Carolyn, can you talk a little bit more about kind of the role that the community plays in kind of promoting this vision that you have? Yeah, so, we, so we've been uh, focusing this conversation on, you know, procedural justice with police, right? So the police in their own ecosystem make policies, and then what we say is, oh, can you make sure that those policies you came up with them, can you, ex can you exercise procedural justice while you implement them? So a chief of police might say, listen, anytime you see a taillight out on this road, I want you to always pull someone over. And then we say, okay, but when you pull them over, can you please just like be transparent and and tell them what's happening. What we're saying is like we actually need to go one whole step ahead of that and say that there should be policy creation between the community and the police and that can be done in a procedurally just way, right? So, but instead of sort of implementing these skills on the back end, we would like more of the community to be involved in the creation of policy. Now, this is, I think some people sort of say, well, can this really be done? We do have models that show that this, they're uh, you know, not just some sort of like a bogus town hall meeting where nothing happens. There are actual um, demonstration projects. There's several going on post George Floyd that shows the ways communities can work together. We don't have enough time to go into them all today, but happy to talk about that if people want to hear sort of some of the more promising ways this is happening. So um, we also highlight in the book, you know, a couple mechanisms for what we call authentic, authentic participation in the way these things are developed. Um, on the research end, we talk about a, a research methodology called CBPAR, which is community-based participatory action research, which sort of includes the people that are most closely experiencing uh, interactions with the police or justice involvement to be the designers of the research, the implementers of the research, and all of that. Um, we also take a, take a moment to talk about different stories where we have seen communities and cops in dialogue in ways that are productive, um, just to show that this, this can be done with the right leadership and the right sort of guardrails around these conversations. Um, any other thoughts on communities? Often the police take the position that the community doesn't have the capacity to cooperate with them in designing policies. And so one of the things that we talk about in the book is the considerable amount of evidence that that doesn't need to be true at all. It's very clear that communities can have an important and meaningful role in designing policy. They don't have to just react to policy that comes down to them from the police department. And as Caroline said, we talk about some techniques that have been effective in different communities. But I think the evidence is very clear that meaningful cooperation can occur, and it certainly has occurred in different communities in different settings, and that procedural justice as a conceptual framework is a good way to talk about the qualities that lead that kind of broad deliberation to be effective in coming up with a consensus about what communities want. Just a side note, I want to say one thing. One thing I've noticed about Tom is that when we talk about this work, when he starts by explaining just legitimacy-based policing or procedural justice in policing, he uses the word comply a lot in compliance. This is how we get people to comply. This is the goal of compliance, is coercion. And then when you start talking about what it means for community vitality, you never use the word comply. You start saying things like cooperate, conversation, dialogue. So you can see it's like really, it is really black and white, especially when you've been doing this work for so long. Like there is this model that is just completely based on force compliance versus one that's, you know, the goal is cooperation. So, yeah. Can I say more or are we on? I think we're on. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I, we live in a world that has a lot of political realities, and I think no one is more aware of that than somebody who works in the area of criminal justice. And we've seen a lot of really good reform ideas not get much traction because conservatives have been very effective in raising fears, frightening people, and making it hard to change existing institutions. And so one of the reasons that I talk about compliance is I don't believe that any kind of reform is going to get much traction unless we can emphasize to people that it does not reduce the likelihood that the police can get compliance. 
On the other hand, as Caroline said, we don't think compliance is at all what the issue really ought to be. We, so we say this model can get you levels of compliance that are certainly as good and maybe better as you're getting now. But here's all these other benefits that make it a good idea for you to make these changes. These are the ways in which communities would benefit. So that's why, yeah. I think. Tom, can you uh, kind of talk a little bit more about how uh, legitimacy-based policing can be applied to kind of current issues in policing? What exactly does that look like? What solutions would be brought about? If you look at America today, the crime rate, I think I mentioned this earlier, is about 25% what it was in the 1980s when there was an enormous increase in the number of police officers in America. And ironically, Biden was one of the people who was behind that. So we have an enormous police force that costs a vast amount of money to strapped communities. But the problems that they're trained to deal with, getting compliance through the use of force, have almost nothing to do with most of what they do on a daily basis. They're much more confronted with social work type problems, community development type problems, or even just ordinary patrolling, administrative type tasks. So they're trained in a task that they seldom use and a skill that they seldom deploy. And they're not trained to do the things that they're increasingly asked to do, like deal with the mentally ill, help manage informal order in the community. So I think what we want is we want to try to make it clear that there's a vast potential here for changing the way communities spend their resources that they could achieve without cost in the sense that it wouldn't produce crime spikes or the kind of danger that's often put forward. But we have to ask the question, how can we do that? And that's where I think the, the moment we're in is, I think, a confusing moment, certainly for me. What is the federal government doing seems like very little. So we're trying to organize a clear, coherent model to push forward policy agendas for the future. And also, I think we haven't mentioned to change the way criminologists think about this issue so that when the police come to criminologists, they get different answers. The reason that the police came to us in the first place was because criminologists had absolutely nothing to say about how to produce legitimacy. Their total research agenda was about compliance. So they had to come to us for theoretical models. Again, we're seeing that problem in research and scholarship about criminal justice, but we see also that there's a change in the sense that one of the emerging new areas of scholarship is legitimacy. So if we can continue to push forward through volumes that are read by criminologists, criminal justice scholars, this alternative model and prevent what people often say, which is in the, the absence of anything else, people default to a coercive model. Here's an alternative. Don't default back to an old model when we were so close to seeing that it could be meaningfully changed. That was a, that was a good end, though. <laughs> Um, you know, approach current issues around policing. I don't know. I think it also just gives us a new way to talk about an old conversation. Um, I, George helped me. Thanks, George. I recently wrote an op-ed about, um, there's a rock star, Zach Bryan, and he just got, he was just arrested during a routine traffic stop and, uh, MSNBC sent an email and said, would you like to comment on this? And we, so we wrote a piece sort of about like, well, you know, it's a good thing he's a famous white guy who lipped off to the, to the cops on the side of the road during a traffic stop and he just got sent on his way, right? That, that situation has gone many, uh, gone way worse in many different situations. But what I thought was interesting is that 
in the not so distant past, this would have really come and gone as like celebrity gossip, like, ooh, Zach Bryan got arrested for getting mouthy. And instead, MSNBC reached out and was like, I think there's a lesson here, right? Like, shouldn't we use this to like talk about like what the cop did right, what, what he did wrong, what it meant, like what does this mean for traffic stops? What does it mean for interactions and how quickly they escalate? Like, do you want to comment on this? And I thought, wow, I'm like really glad that I have this theoretical grounding to sort of talk about this interaction versus just, well, it's, you know, the cop's job, right? And he's got vague constitutional power to, to ask questions whether he wants to or not. And, you know, we were able to sort of have a media conversation about these interactions and why they, you know, why they really foster distrust, which is what this guy, Zach Bryan's interaction was. You know, he was asked questions. He felt like he didn't have to answer them, so he pushed back, so they took him to jail. Um, and it was just this real snippet of, like, a quick example of sort of everything that can go wrong in these interactions if, if we're not really, the guardrails aren't set really tight.